So this is baby Kulwa, K-U-L-W-A, Kulwa. His mother was too sick to provide him with milk, and so uh, they came to our organization, and three weeks later, looked like this. <laughs> Very happy and chubby. <laughs> Welcome all to uh, an exciting book launch. This is, this is the very first book launch we've ever hosted at Trinity Christian School. And uh, we were saving it for the very best and we finally got it. So it's great. Let's pray together. Father, um, we all bear your image and we are a mosaic of your wisdom and your love and your goodness and so many gifts and talents that you've spread among your image bearers. And tonight we rejoice together in uh, the gifts that you've, you've given to Grant. And, and we thank you, Father, for his ability to share them with us, but also to share the way in which you've led him by your good providence. And, uh, the lessons he's learned, uh, young but, but rich in experience. And so, Father, we're grateful that we can all be here tonight. We ask uh, your blessing on this evening, and we pray also, Father, that this book might be an effective witness for you and for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Vanderpool. Uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I, it's so, I wake up every day just excited that I get to work on global poverty. The, the fact that I get to work on that, uh, alleviating global poverty every single day, it gives my life like a tremendous amount of meaning and I'm so pumped to share that with all of you. But before I do, um, Dr. Vanderpool and Cindy, you both have been so supportive, not only with this event, but what a lot of you might not know is they've been supportive of me for several years, and I'm really appreciative of it. And it's remarkable because they're supportive of so many people, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just really grateful. So this is the second copy ever produced of If the Poor Were Next Door, and I want them to have it. Welcome. All right, so global poverty. I love talking about this subject. But first, I want to tell you about my friend, Prince, I have the worst luck with these things. There we go. All right, so Prince. Prince grew up, Prince was a 90s kid, just like me. And Prince grew up in a rural Malawian village. So where he grew up, uh, there was no electricity, uh, there was no internet, there was no running water. Um, he grew up just in very different circumstances. When he went to school, there were 200 kids in his class. And there were so many kids that they couldn't fit in the school building, so the school building slapped a chalkboard on the outside of his school building. And 200 kids sat in the field and uh, got their education outside of the school building. So then if the kids wanted to answer a question, they had to shout and scream over each other. And that was how he grew up. And remarkably, against all odds, Prince performed well in his class year after year after year. There's so many forces working against someone in that position. And despite that, Prince kept performing well. He made it to the city, and he was able to go to the very prestigious African Bible Colleges in the long way. And we actually have two representatives from African Bible Colleges, Andrew, or Brandon Casalino and Ashley. And so um, you can talk to them later tonight. But African Bible Colleges does a really good job of transforming the lives of the students that come through their doors. So P Prince, amazing guy, when I met him back in 2013, uh, he just, he, you could tell he's really switched on. And so I became friends with him and then eventually um, he ended up working for me. You can see he's wearing a donor t-shirt in that picture. Last year, 2018, Prince um, got a call from Ginny, who is here tonight, and Ginny said, Prince, I want to bring you to America. Prince has never left uh, Malawi before. He's never been outside of that context before. And so when he got this uh, invitation to come to America, it was very exciting. So Prince was 
Prince's first steps on American soil back in March of 2018. It's right here. So imagine just like how far he's come. His, he grew up eight hours away from the closest hospital in the closest city. And despite all that, he ends up here in America, uh, able to talk to all of us about his experiences. He also got to go to all of the monuments in Washington, DC. He got to go to uh, New York City with me and Heather. And uh, he actually also got to go to a bachelor party with Kyle, who is sitting right here in the front row. So I nor normally, I would not ask someone if I could bring a random guy to their bachelor party a week beforehand, but it was, uh, it was an unusual situation, so I called up Kyle, and Kyle was happy to have uh, Prince come, and Prince was unusually good at paintball. I was like surprised how good he was at paintball, um, and he earned the name The Sniper. So, uh, you know, when Prince came, he told me um, at the end of his trip, he said, uh, I asked him what his favorite thing was. And Prince said, well, I, was, I got to do so many things. I got to go to New York. I, he went to California, Wisconsin, D.C. And he said, but my favorite thing was hanging out with Kyle's friends because I got to hang out with them and we were just laughing and talking just like I had seen in the movies. So he really enjoyed <laughs> hanging out with Kyle's friends. My favorite thing was when I took him to Tyson's Corner Mall and he got to do the VR headset at Tyson's Corner. I thought, how mind-blowing would it be for him if he's wearing the VR goggles and he's using the latest technology with where he came from. So he used it for about two minutes, he got scared and he demanded that we take it off. And he was really quiet the rest of the day. Um, and I, I thought I had upset him. So I went up to Prince and I asked him, uh, you know, is everything okay? I, you know, I, sorry about the whole VR goggle thing. I thought that'd be fun. Um, and Prince said, yeah, everything's fine. I was like, well, you're just being kind of quiet. Like, why are you being quiet? And Prince said, when I was at Tyson's Corner Mall, I saw that there was a chair that cost $6,000. And I'm wondering, why would someone buy a chair for $6,000 when there are people in my home country who don't have houses and we could build 10 houses for the same price as that one chair. And I just wanna be clear, Prince was asking this out of curiosity. He wasn't mad, he wasn't like trying to induce guilt, he wasn't angry with anyone, he, wasn't, he didn't think it was wrong. He was just curious, he just didn't get it. He comes from a different perspective. And if you've traveled before, which a lot of you have, if you had the chance to extensively travel, um, you know that you get to the, to the new country, it's fun, it's, it's exciting, you get to try all the new food, you get to meet new people. And then there's usually, if you've been there long enough, there's usually a triggering moment, just like what Prince had. And that triggering moment makes you realize, whoa, there are people who live lives that are so much different than mine. I'm not saying better, I'm not saying worse, but there's this triggering moment when you travel where you realize there are huge groups of people who think differently and have a different perspective than I do. So that's what happened to Prince. My book is the opposite story. My book is about how I grew up in a private school and I went to the poorest country on the planet and my perspective shifted when I went that way. Now I want to be very clear. I love that I got to grow up in Northern Virginia. I love that I got to go to Trinity growing up. Uh, one of the things I liked about, one of the things I love about Trinity is that they have a focus. And the focus isn't to shelter kids from the world. It's not to hide kids from the world. It's not to protect kids from the world. Trinity, their focus is to equip kids for the world. And when I got to Malawi and I saw extreme poverty face to face, right in front of me, I, had been equipped too well to do nothing. And so I started saying, I don't know what to do right now, but I know I have to do something. And you know, I, had, I was in Malawi for three years. I saw a lot of people come and go. I saw a lot of people come for six months or a year at a time. They would come to Malawi and they would leave. And it would be like, sometimes it would be this radical transformation. Oh my gosh, my life is so much different. And sometimes they would come and leave and it was like nothing happened. Uh, but I think that I had been equipped well to say, you know what, something here is, it, there's, there's an obligation on my part to do something about it. So at first I didn't know exactly what that was. But I remembered that, that pure religion is helping orphans and widows in their distress. So one of the first things I did was I had been introduced to this lady, Rosina. I've talked about her on many occasions. She was 70 years old when I met her. She hadn't eaten in a week. The house that you see behind her is where she was living when I met her. 
you could take a $100 bill and a $50 bill, you could bring it to uh, this, her village in Malawi, and you could pay a builder and buy all of the materials enough to build the house that she was living in, $150. Uh, what, what we decided to do is we decided to give her a luxury house. So this is a luxury house in her village. This house costs $800, and there are, uh, there's metallic sheets on top, there's cement on the floor, and in her context, this, was, this is considered luxurious. Uh, thankfully, me and Heather got to go visit her this past March, and when we got to go visit her, she's still living in the same house, so we're really happy about that. And then my organization went on to build 150 more houses for orphans and widows. But I didn't want to just compulsively build houses for the rest of my life. I wanted to, uh, as I matured in, in what, I, what I was doing, I realized it's really important that I talk to the people that I'm trying to help and I learn as much as I can from them. And so after talking to Malawian, I talked to uh, older Malawians, I talked to younger Malawians, male, female Malawians, and they all were saying the same thing to me. They were all saying, if you want to help our country, you need to educate girls. Um, they said, when you educate a girl, you educate a nation. So I put together a fundraiser along with a lady named Tia. And Tia basically, she, I mean, she was the brains behind the entire operation. She did uh, the architecture, she hired the staff, she did everything. And then I worked on the fundraising. And we got to build this school back in 2016. Um, you can see it's mid-construction. But that, the, the building on the left, that's the first classroom building. The blue roof that you see on top, the seniors of Trinity 2016 put together a raise the roof campaign and they raised the most expensive part of the building, the, the roof. So they did a really good job um, helping out with that. But then, that was, so there was the success of building the houses, there was the success of building the school, and then I wanted to uh, really hone in on what is it that I am most passionate about doing, and that is where my organization DonorSea came in. So if you're not familiar with DonorSea, DonorSea is a way for donors to see where their money goes when they donate. So if you donate money to a girl who needs hearing aids, a few days later you'll get a video of her hearing for the first time. If you donate uh, money to a widow who needs a house, um, over the, the next few weeks you'll get videos of the construction of the house and the widow moving in. One of my favorite things that we do is we work with malnourished babies. So this is baby Kulwa, K-U-L-W-A. Uh, his, his mother was too sick to provide him with milk, and so uh, they came to our organization, and we, we put the project on DonorSea, and several donors came together to provide $280, and uh, that was enough to provide six months of formula milk for this child. Three weeks later, it looked like this. <laughs> Very happy and chubby. I could show you a thousand pictures like this just for my organization, but it's one of my favorite things that we do because the, the visual is so, um, is so obvious. I started DonorC as a way to remove all of the friction for anyone who wants to get involved in global poverty. They, they hear about global poverty, they feel like they just want to do something about it, but what do you do? I mean, there, there's a bunch of organizations that are on the other side of the world. It's hard to really feel like you're a part of something. Global Poverty was, or Donor C was started to, for, for those people who really want to get involved, but they want something where, where they can see the result of what they're doing. My book is one step before Donor C. My book was written, it's a very personal story, and you know, I wrote it almost like a pamphlet. Not, I wrote it like there's pictures in the end. Um, it'll take you about an hour to read. Um, and, and there's all sorts of kind of sur surprises throughout the book. And I wrote it almost to be like handed out. It's to get people excited about global poverty. Or rather, global poverty alleviation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I'm very excited to, to release this today. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. We're about to go into um, a brief time of Q&A, but before we do that, I want to end tonight with a question. I want to end this part of the night with a question. And the question is meant to provoke conversation. Um, the, it, it's not to, the, the question is, is not meant to say, to, to cast judgment in any way whatsoever. It's just meant to provoke conversation for all of us. And the question uh, should, should put you in a place where you can talk with each other about it and talk with your friends about it. So the question is this. The question is the same thing that you'll see on the front cover of this book. How would your life change if the poorest people on the planet, the baby Kulwas, the Rosinas, and the princes, how would your life be different if they were your next door neighbors? Thank you all so much for coming tonight.
Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll now do some Q&A. Kyle is going to ha hand the mic out to you all. And if you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, just anything about global poverty or donor seat or my book or anything. My toothpaste. Greg, could you talk a little bit about um, how important it is for people, for you to impart faith as opposed to, let's say we blow in and build a school and then blow out. Mm -hmm. but we never actually brought up faith issues. What yeah. part does that play in the ultimate transformation of a community? Yeah, so it's a substantial part. It depends on what, at what place you're coming in. So um, there are situations that are so urgent that you need to act first and then pr provide faith later. So there are situations where it's like, I, I, I always use the analogy of you're walking along a river and you see a boy that's drowning. You don't try and convert the boy first. You just jump in with your Apple Watch and you save him. In that situation, you know, uh, that's, that's the first component. But the second component, which is the eternal component, uh, faith is obviously of preeminence important. Uh, you, you, can't, um, you can't just provide food. You can't just provide uh, material items. Spiritual development is, is certainly just as important. But one of the reasons, I, just, I guess I want to talk about this, because one of the reasons that I focus so much on material poverty, because I know there's spiritual poverty, there's all sorts of different poverties you could talk about, one of the reasons I focus on material poverty is because I'm often talking to an audience in Northern Virginia. And so the disparity of material poverty between Northern Virginians and the rest of the world is why I feel the need to emphasize that over other parts, but they're all very crucial, vital, important. Hey, Greg. <laughs> hey, Ian. Uh, uh, so you see a, a lot these days, uh, locally sourced, you know, fair trade, coffee, chocolate, you know, all these things that try to stimulate local economies. Uh, in the places that the, you would get the resources from. Um, what's the balance you think between providing material assets versus stimulating the local economy and making a better place for the people who live there? So I, so I actually, you would you'd be surprised by my answer. I actually am, am mostly in favor of, of development. Like I would rather people become entrepreneurial. In fact, so I'm glad that you asked this because it gives me a chance to brag about the people that we partner with. So that baby that you saw earlier, what do you do six months later after the formula milk runs out? You've raised the $280, but six months later, you, still, you, have, you now have a chubby, healthy baby. But then what? The kid has to grow up, it has to go to college. What happens next? So um, one of the cool things that my organization does is that's the, that's the step one. And then step two is we provide the child's caretaker with a business. So sometimes that means um, helping out with clothing. Sometimes it means selling clothing. Sometimes it means selling produce and, and that kind of thing. Um, but we have, with that specific partner, we have an 80% success rate with these caretakers who are starting businesses. So that produces an income every month for the mom. It produces a way for the mom to take care of the kid. So I think development is like, is, is I'm just so in favor of that. And I, I think the entrepreneurial aspect, um, I would encourage that as much as possible. But there are situations, I think like orphans and widows are in a different category and so is disaster relief. So there are situations where development is not the most important thing. So. What, what, what do you see, like, the next five, ten years? What, yeah. what, what is you, you know, excited about in terms of future? In terms of my future? Uh, or my, what I'm doing, yeah. Uh, so, um, right now, donor sees in a really cool spot because we've, so in July, we had our biggest month ever, except for August, where we beat it by 13 points, or 13%. And then September, we're on track to be again. So we're on a, on a path to some really nice growth. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is to take what we're doing and just scale it so that we can help more babies, help more people get houses, help more um, people get hearing aids and things like that. So um, I'm really excited about where we're at. So I think growth over the next three to five years. And then there's going to be some pretty big um, like regulatory challenges five to 10 years from now. And that will be. Um, interesting to deal with, but yeah, right now growth is like one of the biggest things that we're focusing on, and the book is a big part of that. Obviously, it, it's a nice way to package our story and and easily distribute it. So, yeah, yeah, we are. So we've we've done work in over 50 countries, and we primarily focus on. Um, there's about 10 countries that we really do the majority of our work, like 80 percent. Um, but we've yeah had a footprint in over 50 countries. 
Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not us just having parachuting in and having p our people. So we basically just partner with a bunch of other NGOs who are already on the ground. Usually, I, I actually do want to talk about this because this is everyone's biggest, or their first question is how do you vet the projects? How do you know that they're legitimate? Um, and that's a totally fair question. So what we do is we provide, we, we have an application process and it takes months to go through our application process and we turn down more than 90% of the organizations that apply to work with us. And so we're really only working with like the most trustworthy, experienced people who have a record and a reputation of doing very excellent work on the ground. So you kind of just answered my question, but um, I know you rely heavily on expats living in other countries to help um, curate and come up with these different projects and things to put on Donor C. Have you looked into expanding that with bigger and larger nonprofits and NGOs and also governments? That's a good question. So we actually are, one of our biggest partners is Cure International. Um, they're a, a multi-million dollar a year charity and they're in 17 countries and they do orthopedic surgery. So one of the things you'll see on donor is you'll see the opportunity to provide someone who had an amputation, you can provide them with a prosthetic. And so they're one of our really big partners. Um, and we're currently in talks with Hope International and a few other larger organizations. We do have like a sweet spot in terms of like the size of organization that is a best fit for what we're doing. But um, we are very interested in just partnership opportunities. And in fact, I spoke with um, the president of ABC on the phone like two days ago, and we're looking at a partnership with them. So yeah, I mean, we have a lot of different um, interests in, in partnership development. And uh, government, uh, I'm, there's no plans for that right now. Yeah. Let's do one more question if anyone has any. I appreciated very much that you wanted to educate women, uh, girls, women, and that you're caring for widows and orphans. Um, I have had the privilege of being in a African country in Uganda in a very remote area, and I was very discouraged by the indolence of the men. In an educational context? In terms of employment work providing. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want to project, but I think it's a problem in most impoverished countries where there isn't an infrastructure for work. So is there any, anything that you've thought about to help men man up, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and I mean, the women bear the burden of childcare and the gardening and the procurement of water and resources. I mean, the women are beasts of burden in Africa, in rural areas, generally mm -hmm. speaking. So I just wondered if you have any vision for trying to equip men to um, provide for their families? Yeah, so it dep it's a per partner thing. So we have some partners who work specifically with like women's issues, some partners who work specifically with younger kids, and then we do have some that work with men. In fact, one of uh, the partners that I would love for, like if you're gonna check out Donorcy and you're looking for something that's kind of in, in line with that, there's a guy named David Peterka. And what he does is, he, it's a two part thing. The first part is he rescues women who have been sexually abused. And um, not him, but his organization, him and his wife run it. And then um, the second part is in line with that, he also runs a ministry to help men be men, as you described it, um, to take care of women properly, to treat them well, and to educate them on how to, um, how to have good relationships with women and with their employment. So yeah, the, I mean, it, we do a lot of different stuff. I, I, I talked about like five different things and th there really is, I mean, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of problems to tackle in some of these parts of the world. So, but it's a very, very fair question. I think we'll end there, but I do wanna do one more thing before we um, head out there. So can I please have um, Grid and Sylvia Glyer come to the front? Mom, you forgot your hat? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> My parents have been very, very supportive of me over the years, and I just want to tell two quick stories. So the first story, I, I moved to Malawi in 2013, and when I moved there, um, there was a, a massive scandal called Cashgate, which caused people to like riot in the streets, and it made, like the CIA said that 
um, living in Malawi was just as dangerous as living in Iraq that year. So it was, it was a very scary time. And despite that, so my mom would always drop me off at the airport. And she had to drop me off at the airport several times to take me to Malawi. And she would always like try and kind of keep it together and be happy. And then right at the last minute, she would just like collapse into tears. But despite that, she would, she was, she always just like really encouraged me to go. I never got the sense that because she was crying, I shouldn't go. That she really believed in me. And I knew it was hard for her, hard for, hard for, hard for her to see um, where I was going and the conditions I was in. So, but despite all that, she was, she was still very encouraging of me. And then my dad, in 2016, uh, we got news that my dad got cancer. And um, I was abroad at the time, and it was a very, when, when that happens, um, your world drops out from under you, and you, you just become, you know, you have all of these thoughts about, like, should I be out here, and so forth. And despite the fact that he was going through treatment and, and, and all that stuff, um, he, there was never like a sense that I should come home. He was all, and it was always, there was never a sense that you should even feel bad for him. It was always like, Gret, I support you, I want you to be out there, and I, I'm just really proud of you. And so um, one of the cool things you get to do when you launch a book is you get to dedicate it to someone. So um, when you get your books, you'll see in the front cover, it says, to my parents for their unrelenting support. So thank you both very much for your unrelenting support. Okay, so now my lovely wife is gonna come up here and she's gonna give a few logistical annou announcements for the rest of the night. And uh, then um, me and my team are gonna head out there and get prepared for all of you. So thank you again so much for coming.